Hello, hello, and welcome to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by the Hockey Podcast Network. My name is Nick Berlansky, joined as always by Nick Horwat. And you know what? When I look at Penguins Twitter, when I look at this fan base right now, I see a whole lot of doom and gloom, and I don't blame most of it. But come on, guys. We're getting ready for the playoffs. It's still an exciting time to be a Pittsburgh Penguins fan. I understand it's not going great. But at the same time, who all wants to count out Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin? Because I I think that most of the time when that happens, we get pleasantly surprised. So, Horwat, are you as doom and gloom as everybody else is right now? Uh, Not as everybody else, but I'm definitely more doom and gloom than you are. Yeah. Uh, You have some positivity going into this postseason. You're right. I'm not counting out Malkin or Crosby. I'm not. I'm not counting out Crystal Tang. I'm counting out almost everybody else, but I'm not actually counting them out. I am giving them their fair shake of they've just looked God awful recently. We, yeah. we set aside the flyer game and just said, no one wanted to be there on either side. Mm-hmm. And then they showed up to the Oilers game and we talked about it being the measuring stick game for the postseason, like the last possible one for the postseason. Yeah. Um, if that's our measuring stick, we're screwed. <laughs> We have one more game to maybe kind of maybe look like we give a shit, uh, but it's also the last game of the season. So who knows if guys like Malkin, Crosby, or Latang are even going to be on the ice? Mm-hmm. I would assume Malkin is just because he hasn't had a ton of playing time this year anyway. Yeah. Um, but like everything else, whew, we have not looked good. We have four wins in the month of April. That's not good. How many games have we played in April? A couple at least. But more like, than four. Yeah, <laughs> more than four. I think more than eight. So yeah. We're not doing well in the month of April. You can, I can totally understand where people are coming from. One of those wins is an overtime win, so that's not ideal either. Uh, man, it's just the wrong time to be hitting a cold streak, but the only thing that is giving me a little hope is that the postseason is coming up. It is a restart. It is a – all records are now 0-0. It is a – Fresh new beginning for a new part of the season that maybe things turn around. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to remember past seasons, how we've looked going into the postseason, because as we can all remember, we haven't looked good going in. We haven't looked good in the postseason the last few years. Yeah. Um, that's a five out of six, winning five out of six last season to get shelled in uh, six games in the postseason. Oh, we looked bad going into the postseason in 2020. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. Before yeah. the before the COVID break, that was the Western California yep. road trip and everything. That was a team that, even though they had that extended break, they looked awful before the COVID shutdown. And everybody thought, oh, this actually might help out the Penguins because they'll get healthy, they'll get certain players back into the lineup, and it just it, it didn't go well in that in that bubble up there in Toronto. That's yeah. for sure. And then going into the sweep against the Islanders in 1819, we looked about average, it looks like, okay. ju- judging by just the little red and blue or red and green marks on hockey reference. Mm-hmm. Um, it's still not ideal to go in ice cold like that. Yeah. Uh, the COVID year, you kind of have to let slide because there was, what, two months off? Yeah. So I'll let that one go. But otherwise, we looked hot going into the, se- going into the playoffs last year. And the, the playoffs weren't a total downfall. It just took a bad goalie and then uh, certain players just not showing up. I think it was interesting. But this season, you don't want to go in cold. For the love of God, get a win against Columbus to have the give the fans some sort of momentum and some sort of push to look forward to in this postseason. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I posted about this yesterday on Twitter, and I said, you know what? The last two games, I will say, they looked disinterested. So I don't take the outcomes that much into a consideration with – they're going to look better than that in the postseason. That's that's a fact. But the problem is, and we saw it in the NBA with the Brooklyn Nets, they were the only team to be swept in the first round of the NBA postseason, which if people pay attention to the NBA, there's usually a lot of sweeps in the first round. They were the only team with Kevin Durant, the second best, some people believe, player in the National Basketball Association, with Kyrie Irving. Ben Simmons decided to sit that one out. But the thought was they have the star players, they can turn it on when it counts, and it didn't happen. So to think that the Penguins are just going to be able to flip a switch and be great in game one would be asinine, would be ignorant, would be a complete and utter lack of, of attention to the way that they've been playing, not just 
this last couple of games. But realistically, you mentioned the month of April. They didn't finish the month of March particularly well. So the point being, they've been really bad to extremely bad the last six weeks. And to think that they're going to be able to flip that switch just because it's the playoffs, just because everybody is zero and zero, it's not going to happen that way. They're not going to be amazing in the first game because that's the way that they've been playing. Could they start to turn it around on Friday against the Columbus Blue Jackets? You better hope so, because if they Mm -hmm. don't, I see no percent chance of them winning game one. I won't say that the season is over. I'm not going to be as doom and gloom as everybody, because I still don't want to count out Crosby and Malkin and Latang, especially when there's, they might be in their last dance, as we mentioned on Monday. Who knows what's going to happen this offseason? But realistically, for game ones especially, they're not going to be able to turn on that switch and automatically be the team that won 10 straight in January. Yeah, no, it's it's not ideal for them to look kind of bad right now. Um, mm. I know people don't like talking about radio pundits but i'm going to find the tweet from newly acquired at the fan adam crowley who just said it brings him no delight to say this but the penguins are done you know it's and not just this year with the contracts that are up he means period like that Mm -hmm. was it he had he also said that they've just looked bad over the last couple of games and um with some other news that has recently come out this offseason is going to be Man, we thought last offseason was going to be wild. It ended up kind of being boring for us. <laughs> but, oh, good, good googly moogly is this one going to be. <laughs> good googly moogly. Um, <laughs> oh, it's going to be a fire. It, oh, yeah. Just it's a fire. Not fire in a good way, but just a fire. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say dumpster fire. I'm not going to say garbage fire. I'm just going to say there are going to be flames and not the Calgary kind. And it's going to be quite entertaining i'm gonna leave it at that because it could go either way so many like just going back on our 3m segment a couple episodes ago going up to now this new news we got yesterday down the line which you'll bring up in a second i'm sure Mm -hmm. to whatever could happen in the playoffs good or bad yeah we could have a good outcome to this to this postseason and there still could be wildness so Mm -hmm. oh it's gonna be a fun off season and it's gonna start with it could potentially start with, and, and we'll have to end up seeing, yeah. but I do have a question for you, Horwat, and, and it's a really interesting question that people have started to talk about because of the performance of the Pittsburgh Penguins. But I wanted to ask this on the podcast. I wanted to have this discussion, and that is, will Mike Sullivan lose his job if the Penguins lose in round one of the playoffs for the fourth consecutive year? And when I look at this, I think this is a horrific question to even ask at this point. I do believe that the the downfall of this team this season would be one of the worst ones whenever you had the promise of whatever you had in that 10, 11 game win streak back in January to be at the point where you're at right now is not a good look specifically on the head coach. If you look at the lines that he put out there on Tuesday night, it was not a good look for the Pittsburgh Penguins and the fact that they've been playing this badly and just not showing up to games looks bad on Mike Sullivan. Now the question that, is asked is, is he on the hot seat with a first round loss? It would be the fourth first round loss in a row. Mike Sullivan at that point will have had seven postseasons with the Pittsburgh Penguins. He won two Stanley Cups in the first two seasons. He's won nine series and then at that point would have lost five series. So nine and five, that's when that immortality starts to get chiseled away. The last three, I think, has started to kind of get rid of that immunity that I think is built up because realistically, that's what I think he had. You win two Stanley cups for an organization. You have a little bit of immunity. You have more runway before these questions even begin to get asked. But now if you lose four straight in the first round of the playoffs with Crosby, with Malkin, with Latang for all four, that immunity is gone. In my opinion, after this season, I don't think that he is at danger of losing his job specifically because Fenway Sports Group just bought the Pittsburgh Penguins. He's a Boston guy. You have to think there has to be some connection there. But I also think that immunity is still in play for him this offseason. But if he loses in the first round again, that immunity is gone. And all of a sudden, to me, you're starting basically from scratch for season eight for Mike Sullivan. So Fenway, yes, Mike Sullivan is a Boston guy and Fenway is a Boston company. But at the same time, Fenway coming in, 
um, and with other news headlines that uh, mm-hmm. actually, again, like I said, we will get to, uh, they could want to build their own situation from top yeah. to bottom. And that could include Mike Sullivan, maybe not as much the players on the ice, but that could include a head coach or a coaching staff. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you were talking there, before you hit that part, uh, you know what I heard a lot of comparisons to as you were speaking? Mike Tomlin? Yes. Another Pittsburgh coach that won some cha- won a championship, Mike Sullivan's case, too early in his tenure in the city um, and has been a great regular season coach ever since. Yeah. In uh, Mike Sullivan's case, should be should have been up for multiple Jack Adams awards. Could pop, you could still make the argument that he should be up there again this year. Um, but especially in recent seasons, have given us nothing in the postseason. Mm-hmm. The Tomlin discussion has been happening for years now, years <laughs> that, yeah, uh, probably since Mike Sullivan has got here. The Mike Tomlin <laughs> conversation has been happening of is yeah. this his last ride? Can we get rid of him? Can we find someone new? The Roonies are not big on firing coaches, we know this. No. Lemieux, on the other hand, and whoever, whatever Penguins general manager is in, is perfectly okay with it. Mm-hmm. We've seen Johnston go down. We've seen Bilesma go down. We've seen Michelle Terrian, for what it's worth. Eddie O, for really what it's worth. I mean, he was bad, bad, but you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the hot seat question, I think, does come into play if we lose another first round, lose in the first round again this year, just because that's enough is enough. Mm-hmm. Um because if we lose in the first round, I'm also greatly assuming changes are going to happen in more ways than just behind the bench. I'm assuming on the ice, there'll be some moves. I'm assuming I'm not, I mean, it is general, uh, general manager, Ron Hextall and president of hockey house, Brian Burke are new. So I don't expect them to go anywhere, but maybe some of their surrounding people get moved in and out because it, like you're mentioning, it's that last dance scenario. We got to figure it out this year because we have multiple contracts up. We don't have the best prospect pool, but we have a couple guys down there that have shown sparks. Mm-hmm. Um, moves can be made. A new ownership group could want their own team. Like I said, a new management group, they're still relatively new, could want their own team. Mm-hmm. It's going to be very interesting if there's another first round loss. I don't, if they lose in the first round, I think Sullivan at least survives the offseason. Mm-hmm. But what might save him? again, is being a phenomenal regular season coach. Yeah. So ah, someone's going to have to pull a hard string if we really need to. Mm -hmm. There was a, there was a question thrown out at the office yesterday though, is who's the first Mike Sullivan to get fired in Pittsburgh? (laughs) Is it going to be Mike Sullivan behind the bench of the Pittsburgh Penguins or Mike Sullivan on the sidelines of the Pittsburgh Steelers? And honestly, shit, who knows considering Mm -hmm the kind of quarterback conversations that the Steelers need to start having. Yeah. And the one other comparison that I wanted to make to Mike Tallman, so I'm glad you actually brought that up, yep. is the fact that whenever they have those discussions, they being Steelers fans or Steelers pundits, it's the same thing with Mike Sullivan is this guy is probably one of the top five, potentially top three coaches in the National Hockey League. If he's out, who are you getting to replace yeah. him? And realistically, to bring it back to the hockey conversation – It's what everybody says about Chris Letang. Listen, his contract might be horrific, but who are you going to get to replace him? There is no one. Like, there's no one that you're going to bring in that is going to be better than that guy. And I understand eventually that guy still has to go, but I don't think we're at that point with Mike Sullivan. No. No, I don't think quite yet. Because the team has just looked so good, even without players. Mm-hmm. The team's looked phenomenal without Sidney Crosby, without Evgeny Malkin, without Chris Letang for a spell certain time at certain eras in his uh, tenure here. It's astonishing what happens. Mm-hmm. It's a hard conversation to have. I think, uh, did we ask this question last year too? I think we asked it after the first round loss. Okay. Not before the playoffs. Okay, because this is a common question not it's not, it's not a, it's actually not a common question but it is one that i feel like we have lofted out before mm-hmm. between me and you so who knows um and you're right though who do we get mm-hmm. who do we put above them that's hard because you could experiment with someone and maybe you know pot of gold you found it <laughs> yeah. figured it out somehow some way with a new guy but also how let's look at the penguins history of first year coaches New guy, 
cups. I don't know. Yeah, but that, that's when they take over midway through the season. So Sullivan would have to like coach said, until like, December next year. Like I said, it's sometimes, sometimes it's uh, oh, this this offseason can be so interesting. Um, I think uh, I just want this team to win. I, yeah, we sit here and we try and be analysts as much as we can. We try and be, um, you know, journalists, if you will media people if you will but my god sometimes especially when it's coming up to game 82 in the postseason all of that goes out the window for me sometimes so i just become a damn fan and i just want to see this team win yeah so we'll see how this goes i I'm only I always only think positive things come game 82 into the postseason i don't know why this team could have lost 17 straight you know set resetting the record and i could still be like we still want enough to get into the playoffs let's find that again <laughs> yeah so exactly well, as you mentioned several times already in this segment, we are going to get to the big news that happened yes. on Wednesday, and that is Penguins CEO David Morehouse has stepped down after 12 years as the chief executive officer of the Pittsburgh Penguins. He's been with the organization since 2004. So you know what that means, Horwat? David Morehouse is a product of the X generation, baby. Absolutely. Absolutely. So- <laughs> So he does leave the organization after three cups with the organization, two as the chief executive officer. And it seems like Fenway Sports Group might want to get their own guy in there. We kind of all expected that. But what we didn't expect was the timing for this just six days prior to the beginning of the Stanley Cup playoffs. Horowat, what did you make of this news on Wednesday? Uh, just surprising, yeah. honestly. And it's it, it, it's it's news like that that is – that makes me love what I do at the fan with love doing journalism stuff. Mm-hmm. That was a breaking news story that I had to quickly put out and that's, it got the adrenaline going. I wasn't once thinking of, well, why could this be happening? What's mm-hmm. with the timing here? I was kind of just doing my thing and I was reading over the release and I mean, without a reason given this, at least for what it's worth seems different than the Rutherford uh, departure. Yeah. Cause at least with the Rutherford departure, there was, you know, pundits and radio people saying certain things that it could have been this, it could have been that, it could have been this. When you're just the CEO, not that there's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah. But when you're just CEO, it's you're not involved with hockey ops as much. So we're mm-hmm. not seeing what's going on. We don't know if maybe you, if maybe Morehouse got angry because I, I don't know, certain concessions weren't doing so. I don't know. Like no one knows yeah. what he could have been leaving over. Could have just been, yeah, just time to hang it up. You know, some people, that's just it. It's, they're just done with the work and they don't, uh, maybe they lost the fire. Who knows? It's regardless, he's a Pittsburgh guy. We You love seeing uh, hometown people work for their hometown favorites and succeeding in it. Two cups, three cups. Got a, it, he wasn't super involved in 09, but he was there. Mm-hmm. Is that new arena project. Yeah. I mean, Morehouse is a driving face behind getting us a new arena, keeping us in town, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then also the Lemieux complex. He's done a lot for this team. He's done a lot for this city. And uh, it's not easy to let someone who you've won with go. Yeah. At all. Um, but this new ownership group, man, they're trying to get their people in. I, I really feel that. And, and I understand that. And that happens. Listen, this is corporate America. This isn't yeah. the National Hockey League. In corporate America, this happens all the time. When there's takeovers like this, They want their guy Mm -hmm. steering the ship. And I understand that. And I kind of, and I think most people expected this to kind of happen, but in the off season, it is weird that they didn't give him that one last ride. I don't, again, he might've just done this on his own. We don't know any of the information, but it does seem a little weird to step down six days prior to the postseason, which most people thought it was going to be his last, but at the same time, it, the timing is a little off for me, but at the same time, we do just congratulate David Morehouse on his retirement. Thank him for everything he's done, because as you mentioned, not just for the Pittsburgh Penguins, but for the city of Pittsburgh and the entire Western Pennsylvania area, he has been a really key integral part of making hockey such an important cog in everything that has happened there. Yeah, and like we mentioned, we don't know what uh, led to this, but according to John Henry, the owner, the owner and chairman of... Uh, Fenway Sports Group. Fenway, yes. And Tom Henry. Chairman Tom Henry, I should say. Mm-hmm. Uh, David informed informed them. David Morehouse okay. came to them and said he would be stepping down from his role. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and they accepted the decision. So it is now up to Brian Burke and Kevin Acklin uh, to ride the ship for the day-to-day operations. Uh, and like I said, that's that could be anything. Yeah. We don't know exactly what came up. We don't know the details. We don't know the finer details. We don't even know what the day-to-day operations are of a hockey team for the most part. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we we do know that Brian Burke is, uh, does have hands in on what goes on on the ice, and that is what – a lot of fans care the most about. So mm-hmm. from a behind the scenes standpoint, it's not easy losing someone like that, especially like you said, uh, not just for the hockey team, but for this hockey town. Uh, and we'll see where it goes. Mm-hmm. Fenway sports group has a history of winning. And I think they they'll put someone in who we can be confident in and we can get behind. And if it is LeBron James, more power to us. <laughs> Yeah, that that small of an ownership stake, I don't think is going to make all the big difference. But nonetheless, I mean, Liverpool was just in the Champions League finals over the week. The Boston Red Sox are the Boston freaking Red Sox. So it seems as if the organization is in good hands. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, our 2021-22 Pittsburgh Penguins Awards. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by the Hockey Podcast Network. The season is almost over, Horwat. It is a sad, sad reality, but don't be sad because it's over. Be glad that it happened. That's that's something that I always like to go back to, and nonetheless, when we go back to the season, we always like to do our Pittsburgh Penguins Awards as I kick my desk here and shake the camera a lot. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, we have several awards here. Thank you to uh, Jackson Hollister, who was one of the only people to give us his award. So we will also be tossing in his at the end of this segment here and telling you who he voted for there. But let's get it started with this. Best first year Penguin. And when we say best first year Penguin, it doesn't have to be a rookie. It doesn't have to be Valtteri Pustinen and his only NHL game and his (sighs) first and only. It doesn't have to be Casper Bjorkvist. But it's just a guy that is playing on the Penguins for the first time this season. Horwat, who is your award winner for best first-year Pittsburgh Penguin? So I split it between two because uh, one of them is a little might be a little too new for this category, and that is Ricard Raquel. I yeah. think uh, that was an easy choice. But again, I wanted to also give Danton Heinen a nod because Raquel might just be too new for this category in mm-hmm. some situations. You know, you don't want to argue that. Uh, he's only been here for like 10 games. How can you give him uh, best first year Penguin whenever a guy like Dan Heinen has been here all year and is setting career highs? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to break out the chainsaw, cut this trophy in half, and give it to both of them. Uh, because, I mean, Raquel's played phenomenally with Crosby right away. We saw how that worked out. Mm-hmm. Uh, right away, we saw that could be a better line than with Rust up there. So I think, yes, he, he might be a little too new, but I think mm-hmm. that's a great option to – be first year penguin, especially if he comes back for a couple of years. You never know. Like I said, fun yeah. off season. And Danton Heinen, just because I mean, 18 goals, 14 assists for 32 points. Most of those are career highs. I'm pretty sure without digging quickly and deep. I know it's a career high in goals. Mm-hmm. Um ooh, it's oh, never mind. He had 47 points. Wouldn't it be 47 points? Okay, well, a career high in goals, and that's all that matters. Mm-hmm. Um Thank you, Danton Heiner, for having a great season. I said he could be a Pascal Dupuis type, and you know what? Those numbers look like Pascal Dupuis types. Yeah, more goals than there are assists. That's that's basically a trigger man position, which is yeah. what Pascal Dupuis was on that Crosby Kunitz and Dupuis line, of course. Uh, my first year Penguin, I thought the same thing because Raquel has been so good yes. since he came over. So you know what? The Jennings Trophy in the NHL <laughs> goes to two goaltenders. So best first year Penguin for you can go to two players, two Penguins yes. players. I did give this to Heinen just because of that. I didn't split it in half. I said, Mm -hmm. you know, Raquel has been great. But again, 10 game sample size is is very small or or however many games he's played. But Dayton Heinen throughout this entire season, he bet on himself this year. He signed a lower contract to get out of Anaheim and to come to Pittsburgh. And we were all excited about it. Like you said, 18 goals is a career high. Most of his production as well is at five on five. He doesn't kill penalties, which kind of stinks. He, he's not on the second power play unit, which to me is kind of an oversight. I think he'd be great on the second power play. 
but most of his production is at five on five. And when you look at it, that is so much more valuable than, than anything else that Danton Heinen could do. And he's been responsible in the defensive end. There was of course that little lull there where he was playing four minutes a game, six minutes a game. He was in the doghouse with Mike Sullivan, but I still think he's had a really good season. And for a show me year, he certainly earned his money going into next season. I'm hoping he didn't price himself out of Pittsburgh, but nonetheless, he will have gotten the Penguins first year award for both you and me. I guess he has one and a half awards. Yeah. <laughs> How, and yeah. That's one thing I forgot to mention. How about that last second turnaround? Yeah. From being in the doghouse to putting up uh, a goal streak. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's the kind of guy you want around here who can learn. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Screw it. Learn from the mistakes and turn it around. Mm-hmm. So let's move over to favorite moment this is a new award that we haven't given away the two previous times we've done it but i figured you know what we need something new for this one let's just throw in favorite moment of the 2021 2022 <clears throat> pittsburgh penguins season horwat what has been your favorite moment of the year so my favorite moment comes super early on in this season yeah um, and it is one of the reasons why danton heinen has been so good and one of the reasons why uh, mike Sullivan should still be in consideration for uh, Jack Adams, and that is beating the piss out of the uh, <laughs> Toronto Maple Leafs seven to one with no lineup. Yeah, <laughs> no, no lineup. Not even. I, that was the game we didn't have Jeff Carter either, right? Yes. Like, down all three centers. We thought Teddy Bluger was going to be the one C. They gave it to Erod. Still, he scored. <laughs> that was back when he was automatic. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, looking down our seven goal scores: Drew O'Connor, Mike Madsen, Jason Zucker. How about that? Drew O'Connor again. Marcus Pedersen. I think that's his only goal this year. It is his only goal this year. <laughs> um, and Brian Boyle. Mm-hmm. And then Evan Rodriguez. Against a fully healthy Toronto Maple Leafs team who has, that was what, our fifth game of the season, both of our teams, fifth, fifth or sixth game of the season, had mm-hmm. so much to prove. Those Leafs yeah. had so much to And they lost to the Wilkes-Barre, Scranton Penguins. Mm-hmm. Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, and uh, Morgan Riley, and John Tavares, and Jack Campbell, and then Peter Razek. I think. Uh, I think he was their backup at that point. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, nope, it was Hutchinson. Uh, Hutchinson. Uh, Michael Hutchinson. Still, all yeah. of those guys just being handed a fat L because mm-hmm. Mike Sullivan outcoached them. Yeah, he was doing that a lot early on in the season, and that that's why a lot of people liked him for Jack Adams. But obviously yeah. he's fallen off now. But yeah, that game, especially <laughs> so in Toronto, was a lot of fun. Oh, it was it home because I was at it. Too. Was it I home? Was there? Yes. Oh, they did win against Toronto in Toronto, but that shut was them when out. they had yeah, shut them out when they had won 10 straight at that point. That's yep. right. Shut them out. But that seven to one game, me and Megan in attendance as well, just adding to it. Mm-hmm. Um, because she's a Leafs fan and fan <laughs> is that always fun. Yeah. Yeah. So my favorite moment comes a little bit later in the season. We still have to go back to January for it. And that was the game against the Philadelphia Flyers on home ice when the Pittsburgh Penguins had Crosby score his 500th goal. Oh, yeah. To open the scoring, the whole team comes off the bench, all celebrates the goal with him. Not only that, but let's not forget, that was such a fun game. The Penguins then went down 4-2. to Let's not forget (laughs) that. They were down 4-2 to to this Philly, Philly team that has been awful all season. They were down 4-2 in the third period, no less. They come back with two goals. One was Chad Ruedel to tie it up late in that game, and the, the crowd went crazy. And then, of course, to finish it all off, Chris Letang scores in overtime, looking off Sidney Crosby, no less, who was wide open. They could have probably scored the goal as well. But they got the win. Crosby got the moment in the sun. And at the end of the day, that is the moment when I look back at this regular season that's the moment that is going to stick out in my mind between that. And then the first game of the season, I was between those two, but the Crosby 500th was great. Uh, that I, I see like sometimes when you roll through moments that happen in a year, you forget about things. I, for some reason, totally forgot that happened. Uh, yeah. But I, it's a moment that will be replayed forever and ever on this team for this franchise, because mm-hmm. it's probably the most notable name next to Lemieux hitting an achievement that not many players do. So yeah. Yes, it's an incredible moment and one that, like I said, we're going to see for a long time coming I, and it's well deserved. Mm-hmm. So let's move on to our next one. This is the breakout player of the year for the Pittsburgh Penguins. Horwath, I'll lead off on this one. I think my breakout player, and I, it might be yours as well, to be completely honest. I thought it was an obvious selection, 
Mike Matheson. I mean, he's over 50% in all of his underlying numbers. That's I mean, Corsi, his shot share, the expected goals percentage, scoring chances, high danger scoring chances. This guy has been so good for the Penguins. He has been the second best player on the blue line for the Pittsburgh Penguins this season, only behind Chris Letang, who I'm sure both of us will be giving an award to later in this segment. But Mike Matheson has been right there with him, and then it's not even close for whoever's right behind him. He has been so unbelievably good this season. He still had his Mike Matheson moments, as you can expect. Of course. But he has had so much less of those and so much more of an offensive impact and a defensive impact for this team. I think he's done great this year. I think this is a breakout season for him. And I'm excited that he's going to be back with the team next year. Yeah, I think that was one thing that always, anytime you mention Mike Matheson, the question always has to come up. Is it worth the contract? Yeah. Still, maybe not. But you're right. He's definitely done phenomenal things for the team this year. Um, that is not who I had, but I think you're totally right in the choice of Mike Matheson just because damn, we weren't expecting him to be the second best defensive player on this team. Granted, he was good last year too. People forget about that, that he was not not the worst, not the best, but yeah. certainly not the worst last year, especially playing with a guy like Cody CC. Mm-hmm. Do we remember that defensive pairing that ended <laughs> up being our second defensive pairing? Yes, yeah. I think Mike Madison is a good hockey player. Again, is the contract worth it? Hell to the no, but... Yeah, if we got to eat it for some decent production from the blue line, I think we're okay for the time being. Mm-hmm. We'll see if the cliff comes. That being said, I want to give my breakout uh, award to just because you can't deny what he did to start the season. You can't. Evan Rodriguez, as I've said many times in the last few weeks, used to be automatic. And for what it's worth, he was automatic at the right time mm-hmm. because we didn't have Crosby. We didn't have Malkin. We didn't have Kapanen. We thought he was going to be the one to do this. <laughs> yeah. No, it was Evan Rodriguez that stepped up and hit career highs halfway through the season. Granted, he's on another long, pointless streak. But we can only ask for so much. If For what it's worth, if he was going to explode, we would have liked it to be now. But who knows how many games – who knows if we'd be in the playoffs had Evan Rodriguez not popped off at the beginning of the season helping us secure wins. I don't know how many game-winning goals he has right now off the top of my head. I can find it in two seconds. But it's still, he is two. Oh, would you look at that? <laughs> so, but he was helping so much with this team, mm. you know, win games. Like I said, playing the one C in that Toronto game, being an important piece for this uh, organization early on, playing 20 minutes a night sometimes, 18, mm. there's another 20, like 22. Like he was playing so much mm. and contributing a ton. Uh, first career hat trick this year. And like I said, just remember when he was automatic. Helped this team through a lot at the beginning of the season when we didn't have everyone we needed. And he just stole – him and Matheson both just stole this award from Kasperi Kapanen. Yeah. And, like, that's all there is to it. Yeah, if there was a Where's Waldo award for the Pittsburgh Penguins this year, it would go <laughs> to Kasperi Kapanen. But yes. there isn't one because, you know, we don't like to, to bash on him too, too much because we, we never have this season. That's only sure. That only happened during a losing season. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Well, I'm glad you brought up Evan Rodriguez. Our next award is Unsung Hero, and that's who I gave it to. For all yeah. the reasons that you mentioned, I mean, 30 points in his first 33 games for a guy that was brought back basically to be the 13th forward at first. He took over. He helped out when Crosby was out. Malkin was out. In the first game of the season, Gensel was also out. And then everybody got COVID and everybody was out. But guess what? Evan Rodriguez has some strong ass white blood cells because he has still not missed a single game this season. We'll see if he plays on Friday, which would give him the Iron Penguin Award. I expect him Uh, to be in the lineup on Friday. But nonetheless, his importance to this season is massive even though he has vanished since the beginning of February. I understand that right now, this is a guy that might not make the lineup come game one of the postseason. We'll have to see. I mean, Kapanen might be underneath him on the totem pole, but still his importance at the beginning of the season cannot be understated. He was great for the Pittsburgh Penguins, and that's why he's my unsung hero. Imagine playing all 82 games and getting benched for the playoffs. That, that would that's be, you just so he, crazy. He has to play just because, right? Like I mean, just, I think he'll play because he's gotten better since he, yes. he dropped off the face of the earth, and also because Kapanen is just that bad. Yeah, 
Yeah, you're right. He's, he's certain, Kapanen certainly is not the breakout or the unsung hero because my unsung hero is going to go to big Brian Boyle because yeah. from day one, you could tell the team loved him. Mm-hmm. During his PTO, you could tell the team loved him. And, oh, yeah, what kind of player, you know, it's a hell of a story. Signs a PTO. You don't know if you're going to make the team on a PTO. You might not. He just took a whole year off. Mm-hmm. Well, he gets the deal. I think he probably would have – gotten the deal without Crosby and Malkin going down just because he's Brian Boyle and it would have been good to have that piece underneath this whole season anyway mm-hmm. but Crosby and Malkin go down so he definitely gets the PTO then plays and contributes and how many times have I said over the last couple of weeks he's played double what I expected him to this season so mm-hmm. he's played a ton he's contributed 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 whatever he's helped this team a lot much like Evan Rodriguez just in the in his role Mm-hmm. He's been a great role player. The locker room loves him. And he's a honestly, he may not be the quickest or leadest of foot, mm-hmm. uh, but he's fun to watch just because he's a tank. Yeah. Yeah, I, I've loved everything Brian Boyle has done. Honestly, I don't know where the Pittsburgh Penguins would be this season without him. I mean, somebody from Wilkes Bear would have had to come up and step in. I don't know if that's Michael Chaput. I don't know if that's Anthony Angelo. I don't remember if he plays center or not. Zahorna, I think, played center from time to time, but nonetheless, none of those guys would have came out and scored 10 goals this year and right. done what he has been able to do in the locker room. So I really like your selection of Brian Boyle. I'm glad he did get an award because he has been such an important part to this team this season. I love it. Uh, best hair. This is an interesting one uh, that we always give. I couldn't give to Chad Ruweedle <sighs> a couple of years in a row. I, I was going to give it to, to Ruweedle this year, but instead I'm going to give it to big Jeff Carter. Drinking Bloodlight Platinums and putting people down on Long Island. I love Jeff Carter. He's been rough the last half of the season. He did have a goal on Monday against the, or sorry, on Tuesday against the Edmonton Oilers, the only goal for the Penguins, but even that was kind of luck. So I'll give him a, an award that doesn't have to do with his skill on the ice, but has to do with his skill when it comes to grooming. And that is best hair to Jeff Carter. Runner up, Chris Letang he always is great with his follicles uh just because why not and honestly because why not is the only reason why i chose nathan bowie was my pick did you remember he's on the team ladies and gentlemen there's always it's always nice because we mention him i think at least once an episode just to remind everybody that yeah nathan bull is a player on the penguins and you know what screw it he's getting the best hair award someone uh <laughs> sign him up <clears throat> there you go i i would not have predicted that nathan <laughs> bull would have gotten any penguins awards for this season but there you go that's what best hair is for uh let's move to the three big ones starting with the team selkie award for the best off or sorry defensive forward horwat who are you giving it to uh we're just going to rename this one the teddy blue Bear award yeah basically that's cool. what we're going to have to do i mean he's the best defensive forward on the penguins bar none bar none especially without zach ass and reese anymore yeah that was the only person that really could have done anything but when you played the center ice position then you get a little bit more of of a nod when it comes to playing defensive hockey on the forward side. Absolutely. And so far through this year, I mean, as a forward, 35 takeaways and 86 hits, 31 blocks. I don't know where those stand among the team, amongst the team numbers, but um, those are good numbers for forwards to hold on to because why did I hit an ad? Because um, it's not easy for a forward, especially a fourth line forward at that, to collect those kind of numbers and be one of the top defensive forwards in the league and that also always Zach Castries was, was able to be backed up by this his entire time here backed up by the analytics yeah this isn't just the hard numbers that I just told you it is the analytical side of his play as well that always tacks on to how good of a defensive player Teddy Bluger is mm-hmm. yeah Teddy Bluger I mean the analytics are great not to mention the fact that he broke his jaw this year and just kind of came back oh, in and, right. and really didn't you know miss a beat he's the lead penalty killer on a Penguins penalty kill unit that is now third in the league. So at the same exact time, he's also one of the best penalty killers in the league. So definitely Teddy Bluger, it should basically be his award until he decides to leave the city of Pittsburgh. I mean, he's not, Teddy Bluger is one of those guys like Aston Reese. They're not going to stick around here forever. Yeah. And I think we're all aware of this and that will be a hard move, but he's helped contribute in more ways than one. And in my, yeah, it's been a ton of fun to watch. In my opinion, he should be the third line center, but I digress on that point. Uh, Let's move over to the team Norris given to the team's best defenseman in our opinion. Horwat, I think we uh, have the same name for this as well. Do we not? Yeah, of course we do. 
it is a good boy Chris Letang because yep. just look at the numbers. Oh. Look at the numbers. A career much like, season at age 35 is ridiculous. Much like the NHL does in handing out their actual Norris Trophy, just look at the offensive output that, that Chris Letang <laughs> has put up this year. 67 points tied for the career high. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 58 assists is what touches it, and that is the career high by ooh, a pretty big margin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but his previous was 51. I think he's got – ah, man, he has to play Saturday, doesn't he? Or Friday, doesn't he? Oh, yeah. To get that career high, you know he wants to play. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> it might be hard for him, but I don't think he should play all 30 minutes like he usually does. But, you know, Whoa. again, look at the numbers. Like, these are phenomenal numbers to be put up by a defenseman in his as he just turned 35 mm-hmm. and is still playing on a contract year, no less. Yeah. So much went right for Chris Letang this year. He was able to stay relatively healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, which is also a rarity sometimes. So we'll take what we can get with this and ride it into the playoffs because 67 points is nothing to scoff at, especially from a defenseman. Mm -hmm. Will he be up for the actual Norse? Hell no. The league does not know Crystal Tang exists most nights. (laughs) And I don't know, but for what it's worth, just phenomenal stuff from a 35-year-old. How are you going to be 35 playing defense and third on the team in scoring? Yeah. Yeah, his season has been absolutely phenomenal. You mentioned it. It's on a contract year. That might have been a little extra motivation, but nonetheless, he has been absolutely ridiculously good. And if if he asks for a raise, he deserves one. Yeah. If he takes a pay cut, my God, give him the key to the city because he deserves to be paid, you know, eight and a half, nine million dollars. I wouldn't give it to him for five years, but he, that's what he deserves to be making right now for the output that he that he has right now. Not only does he have Great counting numbers, as you mentioned, career highs and assists, tied for a career high in points. But he has great underlying numbers as well. For a guy that plays clearly and easily the most minutes on the Pittsburgh Penguins, not just in average time on ice, but in total time on ice, I think he has over 150 more minutes than anybody else on this team. It is ridiculous how much this guy plays at the age of 35, at the pace that he's able to play at, not to mention the fact that he's a guy, and you mentioned this a couple weeks ago, he stays out of the box. He doesn't take dumb penalties. He might make some dumb decisions every once in a while, but that is the give and take of Chris Letang. We've been dealing with it for 15 years now or 14 years, however long it's been. And he is by far the best defenseman on this team. Mike Matheson has had a great season. He has been phenomenal, but Chris Letang, there's no other option for this award than Chris Letang. Right. Letang definitely takes dumb penalties and definitely screws up many things, but you know what? You take with the good with the bad because there's far more good than there is bad. 100%. So now let's get to the big shebang, the number one award, the one that everybody has tuned in for, and that is the 2021-22 Pittsburgh Penguins Team MVP, most valuable player to the Pittsburgh Penguins this season. Horwat, who is your MVP? Keep this short, sweet, and to the point, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, Sidney Patrick Crosby. Yep, that's right. That's his middle name. Sidney Patrick Crosby, because I mean, hell, he played if he plays all 82, he might be up there in the actual discussion mm-hmm. of the real of the real deal. Hart Trophy uh, in 68 games played this year, coming off of an injury, no less uh, 84 points, st- staying way over a point per game, uh, not only for his career, but for each season. It is what, 16, 15 straight seasons now? 17. 17. However many it is, it is tying a record mm-hmm. that. Or is he one behind the record now? I forget. I think he'll break it, whatever it is. I think we had that discussion already. 31 goals, 53 assists. Like I said, 84 points. You want to talk about someone who stays out of the box, by the way. Yeah. For as many penalties as he took early in his career, uh, has he learned this game? Has he learned this game? Has he gotten the respect he deserves from uh, stripes? Now, granted, Sidney Crosby, not the smartest move, punching someone square in the face. Yeah. We'll, we'll just we'll, we'll let that one be but um sometimes like I, like we had that discussion before when when Malkin got suspension suspended we had that discussion of they played in a different era and had to learn that way mm-hmm. clearly they still have a little bit of that bit of that in them if anything certain times it makes them a better player mm-hmm. the punching square in the face doesn't make you a better player the nope. swinging your stick around like a madman doesn't make you a better player but everything else playing hard playing strong, there's no one stronger on the, on the ice out there than Sidney Crosby on any given night. So mm-hmm. had he played all 82, I think he'd be given Matt. These are good run for his money at the actual MVP. Mm-hmm. So 
as with every other season of Sidney Crosby's career, you can basically attribute at least five to 10 wins on the Pittsburgh Penguins resume directly to him. It's just what he's been able to do as the number one guy on this team. And when we talk about MVP, there is nobody better than Sidney Crosby. There is nobody more important to this organization than Sidney Crosby. You mentioned his numbers, 31 goals, 84 mm-hmm. points in 68 games played, coming off of a wrist surgery. There's only one other person that's done that this season, and, and that's really Austin Matthews with a 60-goal season coming off of a wrist injury. But Crosby has been so good for the Penguins, so important for this team. And how do you not just give this man the MVP for the Pittsburgh Penguins? Finishing in the top 20 in the National Hockey League in scoring despite missing the first 10 games of the season, coming back for one game, and then getting COVID right after that yeah. and having to deal with that going forward as well. He's been so good for the Penguins. The only other player I would even put in this conversation, even a little bit, is Jake Gensel. But Sidney Crosby, bar none, is the MVP for this team. Yes, and I'm glad you did mention Jake Gensel because <clears throat> I did have a pair, because that's our last award. I did have a pair of honorable mentions because uh, I didn't mention them at all. And that yeah. is Jake Gensel is one because that's a standout season for him. I think he really is folding into the elite of this league quite nicely all by himself. And the other one's Tristan Jari, another honorable mention, just because we didn't see that one coming, did we? No. Not after the playoffs he had when everyone wanted to run him out of town. Me and Ron Hextall you know, stood pat and said, this is our guy. And then here we are, postseason, and with, with a very shaky defense in front of him, especially as of late, and no scoring in front of him early on, except for Evan Rodriguez. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jari was able to batten down the hatches. Also, did we forget Tristan, uh, Casey Dismiss sucked at the beginning of the year. It was yeah. all Jari that was doing this. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so big on him for a uh, good honorable mention for having a great season. And like I said, Jake Gensel just goes without saying 40 goals. Yeah. So he needs to be mentioned somewhere. 100%. And it's, it's sad that he didn't get an award. But honestly, with its MVP, it is Sidney Crosby. Yes. Or bust. Yeah. This year, especially. I do want to shout out one person who went onto our Twitter page and actually reacted to this and gave us their picks. And that's Jackson Hollister, who is a, an avid listener of the show, always comments. We appreciate him tuning in. He said, by first year Penguin, he's going to say Ricard Raquel. Uh, second, which would be the best moment. He's also said Sid's 500th goal. Uh, I got to go run this down because he didn't put a, he, he, didn't, he didn't put which awards it was because why would he? Uh, breakout player, Evan Rodriguez unsung hero all the rookies that helped our team out and keep them afloat i like good that good answer uh, i like that i would include zahorna in that one as well but drew o'connor as well both not rookies technically because they played last year but uh the, the way that they've been able to come in and help as well uh bjorkfist came up hollander for a game pustin for a game i like that answer as well uh number five best hair he agrees with me big jeff carter That's good answer best one and then selkie Gives it to Teddy because it is the Teddy Blue Girl Award, clearly. Chris Tang for the Norris and for Team MVP. You mentioned it, Horwat. He said Tristan Jari. That's a good choice. I do like that choice as Team MVP because of how last postseason went and how he had to kind of take on the city, take on all these fans and you know who all wanted him uh, ran out of here. Maybe not all, but who <laughs> a lot of them. Quite a few of them wanted him out of here and. He was able to just ignore it, put it in the back, and play the game that was in front of him. Yep. So we're going to take a quick break. When we return, finish this week like we finish every week. Shout-outs and call-outs right after the break. Welcome back to the Tip of the Iceberg podcast, brought to you as always by the Hockey Podcast Network, as well as DraftKings. Make sure you use promo code THPN at the DraftKings Sportsbook app for great odds and even better opportunities. Well, it's time to finish off this week, as we do every week. Shout outs and call outs. Horwat is the last week of the NHL regular season. Who are you shouting out? Does it involve the National Hockey League? I it have does- for call outs, but not for the shout outs. It uh, it does not the my shout out does not involve the National Hockey League. As a matter of fact, it it uh, involves Pittsburgh Pirate fans because uh, 
man, listen, the, 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 the Pirates are not going to be good this year. Mm-hmm. We're all well aware of this. Anyone who watches baseball knows the Pirates are not going to be good this year. I mean, what? They've already lost 21 to nothing this year. I expect yeah. that to happen at least two more times. Um, but every win they do get, because you're not going to go 0 and 162, no matter how bad you are. But when you get wins, man, does your team, do your fan, does your team and your fan base have to celebrate? Yeah. And this fan base celebrates by just blowing up the comment section of the opposing teams, uh, the the tweet where they have to say they lost. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're the Pirates, it just says final and then the score. Yeah. Uh, it's I remember they the Pirates are pretty good with Twitter. Um, last season they made a meme. It was just the old reliable SpongeBob meme where it just mm-hmm. they he popped open the case. It just said final. I thought that was clever. Um, but this year it's a, it's on the fans and a couple of the pundits I guess for getting into the. I mean we've only really beaten the Cubs this year, so I'll say the Cubs comment <laughs> section. Yeah, and just exploding the comments with memes, jokes, and just utter just fun. I mean, the vid- the video of Homer Simpson waking up Bart to tell him to raise the Jolly Roger and just that song that you hate starts playing. Yes. It's incredible stuff. Or all the memes where Alex Stump just asked Sheltie about beating your favorite team. <laughs> just <laughs> all the amplified images, all of the just hilarity, just memes everywhere. John Wayner analyzed your loss on KDK AM 1020. Mm-hmm. It's so fun. I hope the Pirates win a couple more games just so I can keep seeing these memes Um, because they're so fun, especially whenever we lose 21 to nothing to the Cubs and still win the series three to one. (laughs) Yeah, Um, Getting outscored by that distance and uh, winning the series is incredible. Also, how about David Bednar? How about about local kid David Bednar uh, who is tucking your team in? Uh, I love it. Uh, Pirates fans are so fun this year. They know that they are, we are all well aware this team's going to be bad. I, I think my favorite of everything in there is the several times that the cameo from uh, <laughs> Matt, Adams. Matt Adams from Slippery Rock University was in there that your team just lost to the Pittsburgh Pirates. It's World great. Series champion with the Washington Nationals, Matt Adams yeah. here. Speaking of, that's the other team the Pirates have actually beaten. They, they beat the Nationals in three games to one in a four-game series. But other than the Nationals and the Cubs, that's basically been it. Uh, we can't. We're not going to be able to beat the Brewers. We play the Padres coming up this weekend. It's going to be a rough homestand, that's for sure. Yeah. Nonetheless. Um, yeah, I think the the Cubs are going to be not a great team. Hey, we might be able to beat the Reds this year. Hey, the Reds are the worst team in baseball so far. So hey. at least the Pet Pirates don't have that uh, that on their resume this year. But my shout out still not in the realm of hockey. But my shout out goes to another sport, and that is the National Basketball Association and my favorite player in the NBA, John ja Morant. Yeah. Not only is he playing injured, not only is he playing with an injured lower body, which is the most explosive part of it, of his game. Like his lower body and the ability to drive the net is why he is so good. The fact that he's playing injured is something that not a lot of basketball players even do. And the skeptics were getting louder because the series was tied 2-2. The Grizzlies are a two seed against the Timberwolves, which are a seven seed. And it was tied 2-2 going into game five. And he put on an absolute show. 30 points. One of the best dunks I've seen. I haven't followed the basketball, the NBA for very long. But I loved that dunk at the end of the third quarter. The picture of it, I posted it on my social media. Just chef's kiss, put it in the Louvre. And then also, with all of that aside, he hits the buzzer beater with one second left to give the Grizzlies the win in game five. They lead the series three to two. I want to see them go to the finals and take on the Celtics. That might not happen, but it was a hell of a lot of fun watching him earlier this week. That, that sounds fun. My, my call out does involve basketball. So uh, oh, that's, okay. there's a good little connection there. That, there you uh, go. Oh yeah. It might, we'll get to my call out whenever we can, but yeah, basketball seems interesting this year. I'm glad that a super team's not going to take it down. I think, I don't know who's left. I don't know who's on what team. Uh, but it seems like basketball is at least getting more entertaining with the parody, mm-hmm. which is good. Yeah. If you consider the Warriors a super team because they have Steph, Clay, and Draymond still, yeah. maybe. But Steph is also coming off an injury. Draymond missed most of the season with an injury. And their best player in the playoffs has been Jordan Poole, who's having his first career playoffs, who's a draft pick of the, the Warriors. So realistically, in my opinion, there's no super teams left after the Nets bowed out in four games, which makes me so happy. 
Yeah, and you know what? I'm just going to make the transition because I'm glad you mentioned the Nets because I am calling out two two teams here. Two teams okay. here. Because this this one does, does also involve hockey. Ooh. The Golden Knights and the Brooklyn Nets. For, <laughs> I'm not going to say the Golden Knights built the super team, but I love chaos. And this call-out is more of an open conversation because mm. the Brooklyn Knights definitely tried to build a super team. The Golden Knights just tried to build what they could and then grossly overpay for all of it. And are now, you know, seeing their downfall. I'm a fan of chaos and watching great teams that paid so much money to have every player imaginable. Jack Eichel, Ben Simmons, Max Pacioretty, Kevin Durant. Steve Nash is the coach. I'm cool with Steve Nash. He this... might be he might be fired in a week. Oh, I love it. Put him on a good team now. <laughs> I love watching those teams lose. Mm-hmm. So I have to ask you, what is your thoughts on just watching the Golden Knights and the Nets just fall apart into shambles in well, front of us. Like I said, I'm backing the Boston Celtics in the East. So yes. it made me very happy because I also love Jason Tatum and the fact that it, it's his coming out party this year. So I loved watching the Nets lose also because Ben Simmons apparently could have played. It, it, it's like the Pelicans. Like Zion Williamson is doing 360 between the legs dunks, but he's still not healthy enough to go out there and play a game of basketball. I think that's kind of a little bit ridiculous, but the Vegas Golden Knights are also my call out. Hey. So we'll just open the floor here. I'm calling them out because I get that you ha- they had a lot of injuries. They did. Yes. And, and, yeah. and nobody is denying that. One of them was to Robin Leonard. He missed a lot of time this season. Sure, be nice to have a guy like Marc-Andre Fleury behind him. But nonetheless, they still had so much dang talent. And they were in first place in the Pacific in January. It's not like they were bad all season long. This is not a team that just didn't meet expectations. This is a collapse, a really bad collapse at the hands of the Vegas Golden Knights. You feel a little bit for Jack Eichel because he finally thought he'd get to play in a playoff game. I guess we'll have to wait till maybe next year. But nonetheless, you had guys like you mentioned, Stone, Pacioretty, Petrangelo. Let's not forget the guys that have been there that are still really good. William Carlson, Jonathan Marshall, so Shea Theodore. This is a good team. Alec Martinez comes to mind. This was such a good team. Built to be so great. Evgeny Dodonov was great <laughs> since the trade deadline, even though they didn't want him there. I'm sure he'll be traded in the offseason anyway. But I would I still am not happy about it because I would have loved to see them take on the Flames in the first round. I would have loved to see them take on the Avalanche in the first round. It would have been premium television, not to say that the Preds or the Stars, the two teams that are going to be in the wild card, aren't going to be entertaining but the Golden Knights versus the Avalanche was the series to watch last year. I would have loved to see that in the first round this season, and it stinks that they're out of the playoffs. I think it's a reality check for their fan base because they have not missed the playoffs in the first four years, so now in their fifth year they miss it, especially when their team was built to be great. But I also feel for Logan Thompson. That's the one guy I can't crap on in this situation because he's thrown into a tough situation. Mm -hmm. The Knights lost three straight shootout losses to get kicked out of the postseason against some some pretty pretty lowly teams, including the San Jose Sharks. The problem is, again, I say it's not Logan Thompson's fault because the shooters for the Knights went 0 for 17 in those three shootouts. That is how bad they were with the entire season on the line, and they just left Logan Thompson out to dry. Two of those three shootouts had to go seven rounds. Nope for them to be over and then also when you look at the way that he reacted it looked like logan thompson it looked like somebody took his puppy to get put down it it looks like he lost a gold medal game or game seven of the finals he looked so dejected and it sucks because it's not his fault it's the people in front of him's fault but i am calling out the vegas golden knights because dang you should have made the playoffs this year also you mentioned Robin Leonard being hurt. How about how the Golden Knights ha- have been handling Robin Leonard recently? Yeah. Yeah, that was weird too. He's out for the season. He needs surgery. He's not out. He's going to – I expect him to be at practice tomorrow. I expect – what was that by Pete DeBoer? And That's then, a guy that I, I don't like. Not only that, said, okay, yeah, sure. You don't uh, have to play. You can do whatever you need. You're still sitting back up. Which is – Oh, man. Because, again, you're hanging Logan Thompson out the dry. He doesn't have a guy behind him. What happens if Logan gets hurt? You're going to throw better, another injured goalie in there who could. You, you better hope David Ayers is on vacation in Vegas. Because, my God, dude. I, 
it's just the arrogance of this team, right? Is that what yeah. this really is, honestly? Like, it's just the arrogance of this team. Like, yeah. first year, cup final, playoffs every year after. They're finally getting their due of, hey, just learn what this league is. Mm-hmm. Take a minute, regroup. Honestly, if they're back next year and a good team and are doing it in different ways than they have been, cool. I'm fine with them. They had the hardest heel turn I've ever seen in this league. Yeah. Um, but – I mean, it's good. I, again, I you you do feel for some of the guys like Logan Thompson, like uh, Pacioretty, like Jack Petra Eichel, Eichel Jack Eichel. You feel for some of the guys there, but man, you you don't feel for the organization itself as a whole. Some of those front office guys, that coach, you just don't. Um, it is just a little slap in the face. It's it's fun seeing them lose, especially after they built up so much and that fan base built themselves up so highly and thought of themselves so highly. And just to watch it all come crashing down. And you feel for the certain guys, absolutely. Also, could you imagine if uh, Flurry was still on Chicago and he was the one that put them under? Oh, yeah. Oh, that... the story would be so much better. But... Well, I, I do think that's still pretty good because it's like yes. you lost to the team that you traded a great goalie away to yeah. when you didn't have a goalie. And guess what? They got way more back for them than you did when you traded them. <laughs> yes. Also, shout out to Mark Andre Flurry for 16 consecutive postseason appearances. Uh... Yeah, it's not the most in any sport in North America. It's nutty, whatever it is. It's <laughs> quite incredible. Yeah. Uh, but just, ah, uh, Vegas. And also, ah, uh, Brooklyn. Good to see you lose, too. But Yeah, Vegas, let's not man. forget Brooklyn in this. <laughs> Brooklyn's still here. Uh, but yeah, just, my God, watching Vegas lose and the way it's happening, it's it's a glorious tire fire. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll talk about an interesting offseason. They might not do anything. They might just hold Pat, and that's not the right move. Well, they have to trade someone. It's going to be dad enough. <laughs> it is going to be dad enough. But so I don't even of, think, I think they'll need to trade somebody else or get some cap down. I don't know where their cap situation is. I, I'm not, well, this is not the Vegas Golden Knights podcast, but so I do Nuff, say. Like, completely changes his teams just to screw with them. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Uh, I do want to say really quickly, I'm sure Nate Schmidt up in Winnipeg is smiling, looking down at Vegas. I'm sure Mark andre Fleury, who's in the postseason, <laughs> is smiling, looking at Vegas. And I think Gerard Gallant, who is in the postseason for the New York Rangers is smiling watching the Vegas Golden Knights miss the playoffs this year. But uh, nonetheless, I-, I would have liked to see them in the postseason, but it is a, uh, it is a reality check for that organization. Everyone that they've wronged is still in the postseason. Except for Nate Schmidt. Cause the jets, you know, aren't there, it but happens. that's, that's going to do it for this episode of the tip of the iceberg podcast. Hey, when we come to you on Monday, it's playoff season. <laughs> scary or exciting nonetheless it is going to be playoff season we will know who the penguins are going to play either the rangers or the panthers i believe are the only two uh uh yeah no it's either going to be the rangers or the panthers i believe yeah. so uh, we will know for sure on monday we will break down that entire series outlook and we'll talk about i mean the pittsburgh penguins it's what we do we'll be back on monday have a great weekend penguins fans <laughs>